Hello everyone and welcome back to the Federation of Alzheimer's Society's online learning series for care interventions for people with dementia during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Shalisa Cassidy. I am a the first link nurse at the Alzheimer's Society of Southwest and I'm very happy to be here with you today. So let's jump into our next module on personal care. So personal care being all those little routines we have usually in the morning, uh, getting up, getting taking a shower, brushing your teeth, getting dressed, going about your day. What happens with somebody with a neurocognitive disorder is that very often this process is no longer so automatic. They might not think to get ready in the morning. They might start, they might start getting dressed but not finish, maybe only half change out of their pajamas. They might go to the bathroom, see the toilet, use the toilet, but then not think to do anything else in the bathroom and move on to something else. So it's not just starting the task, it's completing it and even completing all the, that whole series of tasks. Um, mobility often becomes an issue here as well. Standing in the shower, even standing at the sink long enough to brush your teeth or shave uh, can become much harder, whether it's because of a loss of coordination due to the neurocognitive disorder itself, or maybe another condition like arthritis in the knees, et cetera. So this can even lead to the big, the big fear of falls, falling in the shower. So we're going to talk about how to support people in these contexts, but I want, I want you to keep in mind that even though we're talking about assisting someone in these tasks, and in a lot of cases they might need more assistance or less assistance, no matter where we are, where that client is in their disease, we do still want to be supporting autonomy. Whatever they can do for themselves, they should be doing for themselves, not just to maintain their, their functions, but also for the sake of self-esteem, that, that feeling of self-sufficiency, especially in what are usually very private tasks, and still should be, we'll get to that. So part of uh, engaging with the person, part of building these strategies is understanding what the person's feelings are in this situation. They may have completely lost, in some cases, interest in hygiene and don't really take it so well when you tell them that they need to take their bath. In their head, they just took one yesterday, so why should they take another one today? You know it's been three days. But for them, their reality is that they're clean and they're fine and they might even take it as an insult. So that's one touchy dynamic. Fear comes into it a lot. Again, revolving around the shower, a lot of clients are quite fearful of getting into a shower for a couple of reasons we'll get into. And it's important to recognize that whenever this client is stressed about this, this can lead to the healthcare worker being stressed. We, we see the importance of this task and we don't want to neglect the person, but we don't want to exacerbate their stress or force them. And that can take a toll because, you know, we have several clients to attend to and they all have this need and we don't want to neglect this one person either. So the strategies we're going to be discussing today are, again, all in a collaborative spirit, both for the client's sake and for you to also feel good about what you're doing with these tasks. So just to go a little more deeply into the emotions the person might feel, again, these are normally very private, uh, private tasks, right? And we're not used to being naked in front of someone else. We're not used to showering or going to the bathroom or having incontinence and have, needing somebody to help us clean up. It can be a very vulnerable situation, whether the person shows it or not. Some people will express it very clearly that they don't want you to help them with this, even if they need it. And some people won't express it, but you should never take it for granted that that doesn't matter. People need their dignity. And you know, in a lot of these situations, a client can feel a very large amount of embarrassment or humiliation. So it's important to be sensitive to that. It's important to also understand the source of discomfort for each person. Um, if we take the example of fear of showering, some people are just afraid of the water itself because of where their disease is. You know, they might not understand what this water is for and it can give them the sense of drowning. 
while other people think that are, you know, maybe they have a history at all, it's important to know about that history because what you, what you're going to need to do here is reassure them and help them to feel safe in this environment. So let's dive into a few strategies. Um, number one, we talked about privacy, we talked about dignity. That first thing we can do is make sure the door is shut. It's not because I am seeing this person because I need to help them, that it's okay for anybody else in this setting to see them either, even if it's other healthcare workers. So, you know, unless they're helping with a task, you see what I'm saying. Um, always make sure to close the door, close the curtain, give that person as much privacy as possible. Some people are even going to ask you to, they need your help to maybe get on the toilet, but at the, or they still want you to turn away. But um, even when the person is in the shower and you need to help them get cleaned up, again, if they can do certain parts of their body themselves, they just can't reach others, they should still be doing those parts of the body, especially privates if they're able to do a good enough job. And if you are helping them get bathed, you know, they don't, and they're super modest and they're really not comfortable, you can give them an extra towel to cover themselves. Um, another note I'll make is that, you know, it's important to undress the person really in the bathroom. Most of the time this is possible and you have that extra benefit of the person who's undressing in the bathroom, you know, it's extra private and you're able to point to the shower and help cue them in that this is what we're here for. Help them understand why they're taking off their clothes, whereas if you undress them somewhere else, they might get the wrong idea and be more embarrassed. Um, if you do have to undress them, normally it's not the situation, but it can happen that you have to undress them somewhere that isn't this, the, the bathroom where they're going to be showering, you should still be offering them a robe or a towel. Those can also be cues for like, oh, I'm giving you your back row because we're headed to the back. It can still be there and it's important for that person to feel covered up until they get there as well. Um, but again, it's always best to just change in the bathroom itself. Um, always explain what you are doing. I mentioned the importance of having visual cues. Um, you know, sometimes it's just giving them step by step on undressing, um, explaining to them that we're going to, I'm going to wash your hair now, you know, when we have to get behind them in the bath, show them the shampoo bottle, and then get behind them. So little tricks like that, orient them into what you're going to do. Um, especially with COVID, our faces being covered, it's important to have, you know, even more visual cues that we can show the person and also to articulate slowly and clearly what we're, what our verbal instructions. Um, again, sometimes it can help us support autonomy by directing the person, by helping them, you know, whether it's telling them, okay, you know, wash your chest now, wash your face. Um, we can do it verbally. Sometimes we can also lead their hand to that area as well. Because again, maybe they just need help getting started in that task. Then once you show them, they can take over. Um, always important to have everything ready to go in the first place. So always have all your soaps, all your washcloths handy. You don't want to have to leave and come back on a person that is either scared or disoriented or both. Um, in turn, while we're talking about items, you know, I see the picture here. Some people have preferences for their bathroom products. You know, if a person has a special soap or special lotion they like to put on, after uh, taking their bath, that could be a good incentive for them. That can help, again, make it more personal to them and help them feel a bit more control when we offer them. It's like, oh, would you like your nice lavender soap? There's that element of choice, you know, empowering them as much as possible in these situations. Uh, we can also talk about giving the person something to hold when they're restless. So, you know, the person having your own washcloth, they can, again, autonomy, do as much as they can for themselves, but it also gives them a focus for that person that might get anxious in the back. Um, it's also important to ensure that all the safety features are there and installed properly. This is not just, not like, and this can actually help the person emotionally as well. So there are full of things we can do to adapt bathrooms today 
even in the home, even in the home, uh, the person's individual home. Um, and we can help for a person who's afraid of falling, we can draw their attention to that. Like, oh, you're afraid of falling? Well, that's why I have this bar here for you. Why don't you give that a grab? How does that feel? Solid, good. I'm still with you, but oh yeah, you've got a good grip. Yeah, you look solid. That, that reassurance can be really important for them. Um, again, if another person is maybe restless in that uh, we need them to sit on the bath chair and we're doing their bath with them, but as soon as they get another thought in their head, like, oh, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go get that now, even though there's something wet can happen. If you have a client like that, having a drink or even like a little snack nearby for them to eat in the shower, can help you in those situations. So again, that's part of tailoring your approach to the individual. Um, using contrasting colors can be very, very useful. Colors already give a warmer environment. It can be more reassuring, feel more homey to the person. Um, it can also help the person to notice these objects a bit more clearly. Like we want the person to bathe themselves as much as possible, but if the, the white cloth is on the white shelf against the white wall, they might not necessarily notice it. So having something colorful can give them a stronger visual cue. Um, be careful though with certain colors because having a darkly colored bath mat in the bathtub can make a person feel like they're stepping into a hole. So sometimes if you see them looking down afraid, that might be your problem. Um, using songs and music can also be reassuring to a person. Sometimes you can have like just a small radio like in the bathroom and that can be very nice for a person to feel calmer, to feel, again, a bit more at home. Also, maybe music that they like is a good focus for them while they're in that effort. Um, also, we talked about this in another uh, training where mirrors can be a bit of a trigger for some people because it makes it look like there are more people in the room, especially when uh, this is supposed to be a private moment that might not, this, this can maybe cause a little anxiety for people. So covering your mirror can be a good addition to your environment. Okay, so again, we talked about focusing on autonomy. When we talk about identifying the best time for personal care, we tend to maybe take for granted that most people shower in the morning, but not all do. Um, a lot of people take a bath at night, and sometimes that person who is really not enthusiastic about taking their bath in the morning might be more receptive to it at a later time of day. It depends on the person. You can find that out either from the person themselves or if they can't tell you, maybe their family. So if it's possible to adapt to their routine, um, their, their regular routine that they had at home, that can be very helpful in helping them feel more engaged and in control of the situation. And again, bringing back that element of choice. Um, sometimes, you know, um, it's the way we talk about the, taking the bath that can um, really reassure the person. Sometimes I tell people like, oh, I'm gonna give you the spa treatment today. And you know, you can give them a little massage uh, with, while you're shampooing their hair, you know, offering them that nice soap, that nice, uh, that nice lotion at the end can give them that little feeling of being pampered, you know, and um, yeah, being spoiled a little bit. So, Sometimes that can also help people to feel much more calm during the bath. Um, sometimes, you know, we have, for the person who's really, really against it, we have alternatives as well. You know, those situations where a person, it's just you don't want to go into a conflict with a person. You can try like a dry shampoo. You can try, you know, just having a, giving them a washcloth at the sink and helping them clean certain parts of the body that day. If it's really a no-go, it does happen sometimes. It doesn't have to always, but it will happen sometimes that it's just a no today. And, you know, we don't want to force the person. We still want to give them some element of control. Um, okay. Uh, oh, one other little example. Sometimes, you know, the person might not want to uh, go to the bath because, uh, you know, because they don't see themselves as dirty. They don't see the point of washing their hair, but maybe it's somebody that like, you know, wants to shave or wants to put their makeup on and they're like, oh, would you like to do your beard or do your makeup 
and we bring them to the washroom. It's like, oh, let's just get cleaned up first. And sometimes in that way, because you gave them that part that's important to them, you can do the parts leading up to it a little bit more easily because now they have that goal. Sometimes, again, it just gets them to the washroom to be able to do the washcloth back, you know, standing up or sitting down, whichever. So, again, sometimes it's just about finding the right motivation. Uh, so now, getting into dressing, um, you tend to see, like, it happens that you have a client who always wants to wear the same thing, so much so that it's hard to get them in the laundry because then they're like, I don't want to wear anything else. Um, understanding that preference can be your friend. Sometimes it's because the clothing is easier to get on and, you know, or maybe it is an aesthetic preference and you can just get duplicates or similar outfits that talk to your family. Um, sometimes it's uh, a question of, you know, a person wants to wear something that's hard to get on and that's affecting their autonomy in the morning to dress themselves. If they had something easier to put on, you know, they could, but that's not what they like. That's not what they want to wear. So sometimes you can find adaptive clothing, like things that look, that, that are jeans that are even dress pants, you know, for the person who prefers that. But they have zippers and belt, they have zippers and velcro instead of buttons, and that makes it a lot easier to put on and helps that person preserve their autonomy. But again, you always want to respect the person's choice, choose your battles. If after several attempts they still want to wear their pajamas today, maybe just leave it today, try again later, or even try again tomorrow. All right, um, so for finding the bathroom, um, make it easy to find for a person. Sometimes a person knows they have to go to the washroom, they're trying to find a toilet and they just can't see it because again, they're affected bit visual spatially. Um, having signs on the floor, signs on the wall, making sure that there's not a bunch of chairs, you know, around the doorway, distracting them from the entrance to the bathroom, that can help. Um, once they're in the bathroom, uh, having a contrasting toilet seat, on the toilet can help them find, can, can help them aim a little better too, help them sit down on the right spot, depending on what they're doing. Um, a little note on trash bins, um, sometimes there are accidents, the person, um, you know, goes to the bathroom but they use the wrong hole because we had two holes right next to the person and they're not necessarily able to discriminate the difference between this hole, this receptacle, and this other receptacle. So trash bins with a lid are a bit more useful. And keep in mind, like when there are accidents on the floor, it's important to, to, to show them the hole, the right hole, because accidents on the floor can also be another factor in slipping when it's went on the floor. Okay. All right, so um, again, the person who might not be able to express the need to go to the bathroom, we talked about nonverbal cues. Sometimes a person's a bit more restless, sometimes, you know, they're just walking back and forth in the hallway. This comes with knowing the client, you know, learning to tell that, ah, uh, yes, they always start pacing after lunch in the hallway after they had their big coffee, um, you know, and then they have an accent, they're in continence underwear. Well, now you, you're getting a pattern, right? So you can say, oh, well, I know where this is going. I'm going to go bring them to the washroom right away. Um, another good little trick, always face the person in the right direction for either, you know, standing in front of or sitting on the toilet before you remove their pants because sometimes that's a cue of like, oh, okay, my pants are down, I can go. So that can help you prevent some mishaps as well. Um, sometimes people have difficulty staying seated and kind of like in the shower, have something to divert their attention, to redirect their attention. Um, make sure that the lighting in the bathroom is appropriate as well. Again, with visual spatial issues, proper lighting is even more important. Um, accidents can happen sometimes. It can be embarrassing for the person. They might try to hide it. It's important to be very authentic and reassuring in those contexts, right? To recognize and the, the vulnerability for a person. You know, give them that reassurance, not just like, we're going to go get you cleaned up, but like, Oh, I, especially if it's in front of other people, saying like, oh, okay, I see, I see, I see what happened, it's okay, I'm going to cover you, you know, and place yourself behind them maybe and give them that sense that no one else is going to see. That can be an important interaction in validating the person's feelings and, you know, helping them feel maybe a little less embarrassed than just treating it super casually. Um, all right, so all in all, communication is very, very, very important. 
how we engage in this activity is integral to how well it's going to go for the person, how well the person is going to be able to engage in it, favor autonomy, react, create a relaxing, calming, pleasant environment. Always be aware of what you're projecting as well. It's important for people to be able to take their time as much as possible. Um, and again, you know, tailor this to the person. It's personal care. Put the personal into it. Each person is different. Each person has their own um, and their own preferences. So it's really, really important to you know bring in that sense of autonomy and empowerment always. So thank you for being here today again. And for any other information, please reach out to us anytime.